I'm looking at starting a fund to invest in e-commerce brands right now, but probably based in in the UK or Spain, somewhere EU. Is it difficult to set up a regulated fund? I mean, there's financial audits and things like that that you have to go through. That's the biggest hurdle, really. Um, and, and there's a, a high upfront cost. I'm not sure about in the in Europe or in any other country outside of the United States, but um, it's really just um, track record, uh, legal costs for organization, and then the ongoing financial audits and things like that. that Brittany Fairweather is the Chief Business Development Officer of TRX Capital, a real estate lending firm. In this episode, we talk about authenticity and what it's like being an entrepreneur while having kids and including your kids in your business and how your partners and your clients and your employees view you and communicate with you based on having kids in the business or not having kids. And we talked about her experience um, being a woman in business and some of the hardships she's faced. I know you're going to like this episode. It's 182. We are getting so close to the 200 mark and I'm looking forward to it. Brittany, what's it like being a woman in business for you? So um, we're in real estate lending. It's a very male dominated industry. Um, so it's very much, um, a constant justification for our seat at the table. Uh, we are a minority and woman owned company. Our C-suite is almost entirely women. And, um, we on a regular basis, um, commiserate, if you will, on, 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 on the conversations we have on a regular basis with other men in our business who expect us to be support roles, uh, who expect us to actually get coffee. Um, and there is nothing wrong with that. There is nothing wrong with, um, with, with the need for support staff. And, um, we all have that, but, uh, it's interesting that we've been in this business for 15 years and we still get the questions of, okay, well, are you going to go get my coffee or, you know, where's your boss? Um, and it's, no, no, I'm the boss. This is, this is my company. This is what we do. Um, so it's, it's a lot of justifying why we're here. Um, and once people, once people know, uh, our story, it speaks for itself, but we do, we do get that on a regular basis. Did you have an, an experience earlier in life that led you to believe you would encounter this or was it a shock to you when you, when you experienced it as a business owner? It still shocks me. <laughs> it still shocks me today that we get this on a regular basis and we are constantly faced with justifying why we're here and justifying why we're not at home or justifying why we have someone else to help us pick up the kids. Um, and I actually heard someone, a woman in business, um, say the other day, if you are a successful business owner and you are a mother, someone else is raising your children. Uh, and I was really offended by that because I feel like we can still do that. We can still fulfill the maternal nurturing role that we have with our gender and with our societal norms, but we can still be, you know, really strong women in business, strong entrepreneurs, strong business owners. And I feel like it makes us um, more approachable. And I feel like it makes us more successful in certain areas of the business because we approach things with a solution based mindset, as opposed to why we're only right and why this is the only right way. But it still surprises me on a regular basis. Um, and I grew up in this business. I grew up early on in my career. And so I was constantly faced with it then and I'm still faced with it now. Is there a specific reason why you chose to have uh, mostly only women in the business? I mean, we have men, we have men in our business. So our, one of our co-founders is a man. Um, what our original founder of our very first company was a man. And we just, the reason why we feel like this environment suits us is because we are like-minded. It's not so much that we're women, we're all parents. We're all, um, in similar walks of life and we can support each other um, in what we're going through in our personal lives as much as we can in our professional lives. And because we really end up being more like a family with the amount of time that we work together and uh, are communicating with one another, that's, that's really more important. It's not necessarily the woman aspect of our, of our leadership, um, but really the, 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 the similar walks of life, similar um, path that we're all facing. 
Is there something specific about being a parent that you think makes someone a better entrepreneur or a better employee? Uh, I, I don't think there's something that makes it better or worse. I think it's just a different... Um, it's a different mindset. It's a different way of problem solving. It's a different way of communicating. You learn a lot as a parent. You learn a lot about how to negotiate with tiny terrorists in your home on a regular basis, you know, and how to kind of have some of that balance and give and take. Um, but there are definitely roles where we have individuals in our company that aren't parents. Um, and I think it's just really focusing on who we hire, what their life experience has been, and figuring out what, what role they're best suited for. So being a parent doesn't make you any better or worse as an entrepreneur or as a business owner. I think it just gives you a different skill set um, that other people don't have um, with with real life experiences on on sacrifice um, and uh, and drive and motivation. So I don't have any kids myself, and I have friends and business partners and co-founders that I work with that do have kids. And I've had this conversation a number of times, and what it seems like is when you don't have kids, you have all the time that you want to focus on running the business. But having the kids means you have far less time, and so it makes you more efficient because you have less time to get things done. Absolutely. Definitely um, a different level of prioritizing, time blocking, and really just being super efficient and effective with the time that you do have. That's why when I was hiring people with my last business, I I didn't like make it a requirement that they were married and had kids, but I found that people who were married and had kids would be a lot more stable. They were less likely to disappear or to quit and find a better opportunity because they were focused on making sure that they could provide for their family in a way that was stable. And so- uh yeah. You knew that you were going to get kind of uh, more consistency out of them. Yeah, I think you have the, the perception of, of longer, of longevity with, with that employee or with that particular hire. Um, you're right, they are um, less likely to uh, make career changes on a whim or, you know, um, but yeah, I, I would agree with that. I find not having kids to be quite freeing in a way. Like I'm, I want to have kids. But I'm divorced, so I didn't have the opportunity. Well, I, we didn't have the opportunity to have kids. Um, but I was talking to someone the other day, and I was saying, like, oh, yeah, I'm going to be going to this place and then this place and this place. And they're like, oh, it must be nice. You could just kind of pick up and go wherever you want, whenever you want. And you don't have to worry about, like, packing for a kid or carrying them and, and uh, planning around their needs. And uh, I was like, yeah, you know, there's something nice about that. But I think you could still have that with kids. Have you tried to travel with your kids? I travel with my kids all the time. Yeah. Uh, it takes a lot more planning. Yeah. Uh, so <clears throat> I am um, I had children when I was in my early 20s, and then I had a second pair, <laughs> literally, in my, uh, l in my early 30s. And I have traveled with all four of them um, from the time they were infants. I traveled across the country with them during COVID in an RV. Um, to get to my team in California uh, to be able to work in person when we couldn't fly. Um, I haven't traveled internationally with my children yet. Um, that's, a, that's something that I haven't quite wanted to wrestle with, but I do travel with my kids. Um, I've taken them with me to conferences and events um, and, and kept them with me there and they've come down. And I actually had my 14, who's now 14, my son um, was in the restaurant of a conference that I was attending and he was having a conversation with my mom who was there um, helping me watch them while I was working. And they sat down and we were in a, it was a conference venue. So there was everyone that was there for the most part were for the event, for the conference. And so these two men walked over to the table where my mom and my son were sitting. They're like, what are you, what are you doing here? Everyone is here for the conference. And my son stood up and he's like, this is my mom. This is what she does. She's, she's been in this business. This was her company. And he was telling my whole story to these two gentlemen. And then I ended up meeting them later in the evening. And they told me about the story and how they met. I hadn't, I hadn't met them yet. And, uh, and they told me this whole story about how my son was out there pitching our company and telling them all about what we did. And I think that makes really well-rounded humans. Um, I think they, they see a lot of the struggle that we have. They see a lot of the sacrifices that we make for them to give them the life that we do give them. And uh, I think personally that it makes, it makes them well-rounded and, and really awesome little, little humans. Yeah, I think it's great when kids can be included in, you know, your business. I have uh, experienced myself with my dad being a dentist. So I would 
you know, be a part of his business when I was a kid. And I don't know how much uh, financially I contributed by being around, but I know people really appreciated me. And um, I got an opportunity to talk to tons of adults and uh, I got to learn, you know, how to, uh, like, I, I just got to learn about them, you know, their, their names and their stories. And, you know, later on, I ended up working with him when I was an adult and, you know, some of these people I recognized from when I was a kid um, and some of them were new, but the, you know, the, my coworkers uh, and my dad were always fascinated by how I remembered everything about every person I came across. Um, I think I, I may have learned that skill from being really young and just being able to talk to, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people every year um, just by being there. And uh, I interviewed a guy probably in 2023, I think uh, probably about a year ago, and he's running uh, an agency and a software company. And his kid is like doing sales. The kid's like nine years old and he's doing sales for the business. Um, and I thought that that was really fascinating that he was including him in the business, that the kid understood what his dad was doing for work and, and that he was interested in it and, and able to contribute, like legitimately closing clients for the business. That's awesome. He, he's like going, I think he was like doing linked, uh, LinkedIn cold DMing and like <laughs> booking calls and getting on the phone and talking to clients. Like these are, these are companies that are seven, eight figure brands. And he's just like on the phone pitching them the business. That's hugely valuable because especially in, in our society and in our world now where everything is virtual. I mean, I live in Pennsylvania where we get snow and we had like a dusting the other day and they called off school, right? Because they can, because the kids can do school virtually now. Um, but in, in, in a world where, where you can be and do anything from behind the screen, I think it's so important for the kids to be able to have that firsthand experience of talking to people and getting out there and getting, uh, having, you know, uncomfortable conversations from the perspective of the fact that they're a child talking to an adult, but it gives them valuable life lessons that even schools don't teach. Um, and, and maybe colleges would, would really educate, um, and provide some of that skill set. So. I think the more important thing to think about is having adults being willing to talk to kids like they're they're not kids. Um, like when I was in college, I was part of a, a group that well, it was like a, all right, it was a religious group, and the person in charge had a number of kids, like many many kids, and these kids literally grew up around college students. They're like, you know, three, four, five, six years old, and they're talking to college students all day long. And so when you talk to them, they, they're they like, you know, little kids, but they talk like they're adults. And it's because the students that they come across are willing to communicate with them. I, I remember being a kid and people, some people tried to include me as if I was there and other people were like, oh, he's a kid, just like, you know, don't. But it would be on me. I'd be like, yeah, I want you to include me. Why are, you know, just because I'm, I'm a kid doesn't mean I can't add value to this conversation or whatever. Or at least just let me sit here and listen to you talk. Um, There's something that my, my parents remind me of uh, all the time. That I, When I was a kid, I used to approach strangers and ask them for coins to throw into the fountain at the mall <laughs> to make wishes. And, like, they would give me money. So, um, so I'd, yeah, maybe not anymore. Maybe parents wouldn't let their kids do this <laughs> now, but at least back then, um, I, I feel like there was a lot of opportunity for kids to do that. I, I remember as well, um, the pre-industrial era, uh, farmers were having a number of kids because they would basically get free labor. Right. So it, it feels like in, in the same way now, it's just, uh, you know, pitching your B2B SaaS or pitching your fund or whatever it is with, you know, if your kid's involved, you're essentially using them, uh, you're giving them the opportunity to learn your business and to, to learn different skills. And at the same time you get, you know, labor Yeah. in a way. <laughs> I, um, when my son, who my oldest is 14, when he wants to earn extra money, when he wants to get a new snowboarding pass or whatever it is that he happens to want, that's not a birthday or a Christmas or whatever, you know, I make him work for it. And, um, so I have an extra computer and if I, ha I have deals that come in, I have logged them into our CRM, taught him how to do the data entry and put things together, taught him how to look up, you know, Google Zillow mine, uh, what he can from public records online and fill in spreadsheets for me. And 
I mean, that's stuff that hopefully will help him in life uh, at some point. And he's not going to really learn that in, in, in high school anymore. I, I remember learning no. Excel in high school and they don't even teach that stuff anymore. You learned Excel in high school? I took computer that classes in high school. Okay. I'm not going to ask you to, to date yourself. Um, I, I, end of high school. I didn't have that opportunity, but I was involved in a networking class. It was like this invite only class. So the, the, the guy who ran it was uh, the teacher of VB, uh, virtual basic and C++ classes. Yeah. And you would have to go through both of those classes. So it was like two years. And then he would have to invite you. And the, the purpose of the class was to make sure that the network of computers ran smoothly. We had 1,400 computers in our network. And so we were this elite class of like 10. And we would run around the school fixing the computers and ghosting the computers to make sure that there was any problems that you know we would take care of them. Um, and that was a really cool experience. And it also taught me that I did not want to work in IT. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, my computer classes also taught me the same. I was not really interested in that. I became yeah, very good friends with the woman who taught my computer class, actually. I was her nanny for a while and, and even more working with her and seeing how much she got calls the craziest times for down servers that were down and, and all kinds of craziness having to get in and, and do all that. But So... Our goal is to kind of talk about authenticity. So we've talked about kind of giving people opportunities, especially kids, um, and like having kids be around. Do you think people like prospects or, or existing clients or potential business partners, do they look at you like, wow, that's incredible. You're involving your kid. Or do they feel like, oh, well, you can't afford a per you know, an adult to do this job? Like, how do you think people look at you in terms of authenticity in that regard? It's both ways. A thousand percent. I get both responses. I mean, there are some individuals that I work with that think I should palm that job off to a nanny or whatever the case may be. And don't get me wrong. I have an amazing babysitter who does a lot for my family. Um, but there are some things that that to our point, to our goal about talking about authenticity that I want to do for my children, with my children as a mother, as their mother and the role model for them that I will never pawn off um, unless there was an absolute need that couldn't be pushed off for an hour. Um, so I, I get I get both sides of that coin. I do get people who respect the boundaries that I set and I say, if you want to talk to me at this particular time, like I'll answer your phone call, but I'm going to be giving my kids a bath or I'm going to be in the middle of, of, um, of getting them ready for dinner or driving them to hockey or whatever the case may be. I am available 99% of the time and will, and will always um, preface that when I get on the phone with someone. I said, I'm willing to answer. I'm willing to be available to you, especially because I'm in the business development and the sales role. Um, and that's the, you know, that's the walk of life that I've chosen. And I realize and understand that there's an availability that I have to be able to provide that other operational roles might not need to be, uh, be in that same demand. And I, so I find that I either get people who understand the boundary and respect my authenticity and respect the fact that, you know, I'll answer, but I'm going to be a little bit preoccupied. Uh, and I get other people who, who definitely, you know, turn their nose up to it a little and say, well, why don't you just have someone else do that? Or I'm more important. Um, and to be honest now at this point in, in my career, I've been doing this for over 15 years. If that's going to be their attitude, I don't really think they're the right client for us. Yeah, I agree. This happened to me a few days ago, actually, someone was asking me questions. It was like, you know, midday Sunday and I don't work on the weekends. But like, if someone sends me a message, I'll just be like, hey, how's it going? And he was like, oh, let me ask you some questions. I'm like, here's the link to book a call with me. I'm happy to talk with you tomorrow. I have some of the slots available. And he got pissed and he didn't. And he was like, all right. Blah. And then like two days later, he booked a call. Yeah. Because if you I was have, like, if yeah, you have sorry, a service, it's my Sunday. Right. If you have a service and you, or you have a product and that that is valuable and that is needed, um, people might initially be put off by your boundaries. Um, but they will, they will come back. And, and most of the time I found that they end up appreciating that. Um, and I've started to notice that people in general have, um, adjusted, I would say to, to that. Um, maybe it's because I'm older now in my career. Maybe it's because, um, I'm better about 
Hey, just give me 10 seconds of your time. I really appreciate you listening to the episode so far, and I hope you're loving it. And if you are, I would love to ask you to subscribe to the channel because what we do is a lot of work. And every week we bring you a new guest and a new story. And what we do requires so much love so that we can bring you something amazing. And every week we're trying really hard to get better guests that have better stories and improve our ability to tell their stories. So your subscription lets the algorithm know that what we're doing is fantastic and no commitment it's free to do and if you don't like what we're doing later on you can always unsubscribe and either way we would love a like if you don't feel like subscribing at this time thank you very much and we'll take you back to the show now initially being genuine with what my life looks like outside of my career um but i've noticed that people have started to be like hey i understand if you're not around on a sunday but if you happen to be, can we jump on a call? Or I understand if you're not working today because it's Martin Luther King and your King Day and your kids are off school. But if you're around, could we jump on a call? If not, tomorrow's fine. So I've started to notice literally this happened over this past weekend. I have started to notice that um, that people are more receptive to that. And they're also the people that I want to work with now. Those are people that um, and, and most of them are older than me. And they're like, listen, it goes fast. Enjoy it. Like, so they're kind of coming up into their, you know, mentorship uh, years. Right. And they're, you know, saying, enjoy the extra couple of hours that you're going to take really in my line of work. Nothing is that urgent that it can't wait for me to finish a couple of hours of, of quality time with, with my family. Fair enough. Yeah. I had another, uh, guy come to me. We had had a call before and he needed to do some more work before he'd be ready to move forward with me. And he, he was like, I'm pretty sure it's like late evening for you. I'm just going to send this message anyways, but like if you don't respond until tomorrow, like no big deal. It's fine. Um, and I didn't respond. I read it, but I didn't respond. And so I responded this morning, but, but yeah, I, I think, I, I guess you're just working domestically with Americans. Yes. For the most part, we have international investors, but the assets that we work with are all um, us based. Okay. Yeah, because I get people messaging me from all over because I'm working with e-commerce brands, people that are buying from China. So mm -hmm. I'm dealing with people in China and other countries in Asia, like Singapore, Hong Kong, um, uh, Thailand. But then I'm also getting people from the European Union and people from the you know U.S., Canada, um, Mexico messaging me. So I I have oh, to be available, <laughs> right? So like I try my best, but at the same time, like I'll just respond when I have a chance. Yeah. And people are generally willing to accept that. And I don't have to go, you know, or actually, what was it? I, uh, someone had said, hey, can we get on a call? And I was like, yeah, but it's going to have to wait an hour because I just want to get lunch real fast. And they're like, all right, fair enough. Have your lunch. Right. Trust me, you don't want to talk to so, me when I'm angry, so. Yeah. I, I remember talking with someone. Uh, yeah, I, I was advising someone last year. And his pricing was really low and people weren't converting. And I think they weren't converting because his pricing was too low. I felt like they couldn't understand the value because he wasn't charging enough for them to go, oh, okay, I get it. And so I tried to get him to do that. And he's like, uh, I'm afraid of losing my existing clients. Because I was saying you should start by increasing your current you know, customers to, to pay more. And then anyone new that comes on, you know, you, you charge them that amount as well. And I said, look, if you if you just tell these people, hey, look, you know, I I know you've been using the service for X number of months, years, whatever. I hope you've been enjoying it. For me to be able to continue to develop new features and provide high quality service for you, I need to increase my price. And you know, if you're willing to do that, uh, if you're willing to pay me for a year up front, I'll give you 10% off, and then you know, the year after, or or even I'll I'll give you 50% off, whatever, just like to keep them happy. And and he's like, why would they do that? He's like, why wouldn't they just tell me to go away and, and you know, find another person? I go, you may have some people that will go away, but screw them. If they only and cared about the price anyways. Come back. Right. And when they come back, you charge them full price. Not a 10% discount. No, because they walked away. So they, they stopped being a customer. So they don't get that, that you know, uh, special deal. But I, I said to him, you know, the point being, if you communicate with them about your needs, you go, if, if you are willing to help me on this, then I can help you. Then, 
you know, generally they're willing to do that. There was a, another guy I interviewed who was in debt three million with his business, and he turned around and turned it into last year they did seventy million in revenue. And the thing that changed was he was having people post pay, and when he did that, he wasn't able to grow the business. He had one client that was that could potentially pay him like half a million a month um, in in services, and he went to him and he's like, look, I would love to be able to keep working with you, but the way it's going now, I'm struggling. If you prepay, I can grow my business very easily and continue to serve you. Are you willing to help me do that? And he was like, yeah, sure, no problem. And so just off the back of that, he was able to grow the business to, you know, out of debt and, and to eight figures in revenue yearly. And so, yeah, I've, I've seen it um, a lot as well. Like I've had people try to get me to negotiate on my pricing when I was doing consulting, um, in a, a previous business. And I was like, look, this is the fee for me to be able to provide you the service. If you don't like that fee, I'm happy to introduce you to someone who's willing to work for the price you're able to pay. But if you want me to help you do this, this is the money that I need to be able to provide that service at a high quality standard. And the difference between me and those other people is that I'm super attentive to detail and you know what you're going to get. I never lie. I document everything. I'm super transparent. And if that's what you want, that's what you're going to pay for. If you don't want that, yeah, no worries. And and I got people to you know pay me 100% up front for the work I was going to do because of that. It wasn't like, oh, you know, 10% now and then 25% you know, at this point. And then, no, it's like, you want me to get the work done? Pay me now. And they're like, okay. So when when you are willing to show your personality and show the value you bring then Absolutely. and if authenticity is part of that then people are are generally willing to trust you yeah and 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 not only to, you mentioned a little bit about the the honesty and the trustworthiness i mean that's that goes into to authenticity you know if we 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 are a, a lender you know that's our business we're a lender um, an equity provider a capital provider and if our cost of capital increases we we have to pass that cost off in in part to our clients as well to the people that are borrowing from us and and by by explaining that and and educating them on where the industry is going or why the cost of capital is increasing or the other services that we're able to provide over a, another competitor that goes into that authenticity, that goes into that honesty and trustworthiness. And it's not that there's an increase in you know, our margin at all. It's really just that we have to pass on the additional cost to us. There are other things that we do as a service related industry business, as a lender, that we that we don't make a margin on at all. And, and a lot of other people do. And so when you are genuine and honest and kind of open the kimono a little bit and explain the business strategy behind why something's changing people people feel there's validation there and they continue to trust and they stay and that's what i have found um is that when you have that whether that that authenticity be who you are as a person who you are outside of your your career uh or or just generally why things are changing in the industry and being very transparent with people there's an appreciation there and you continue to have long-lasting relationships and 15-year clients that we've had um since we started. Yeah. So one of the things I do, or the thing I do now is e-commerce consulting, but most of what I'm doing is passing on my clients to referrals, right? People who can provide services that I don't provide. For example, I have a close friend who runs a third party logistics provider or third party logistics services out of China. So they do sourcing, purchasing, fulfillment, storage, and uh, packing, shipping, and all that. I can't do that. I don't want to do it. That's his business. I'm going to trust him to do it. So I may have a strategy call with a potential client and I don't charge them for the call and I give them advice for free. And if they're a fit for my friend's company, as an example, then I'm going to introduce them. And they're like, why are you helping me? Like what you, you're not getting anything out of this. I go, well, if you work with my partner, then he's going to give me a commission for you working with him. So if you work with him, great. If you don't work with him, you still get you know, value for me. And people appreciate that because generally my model is if I don't save you money, I don't get paid, right? Because a lot of e-commerce brands, their focus is how can I lower the cost of goods? How can I lower my payment processing fees? How can I get my shipping to be faster and cheaper, right? So everything is about how can I lower my cost? Because the margins in e-com aren't really great 
a lot of them, um, but you can grow quickly with them. So as uh, so I was telling this to a potential referrer and he was like, this is such an incredible offer. I've never heard anyone say like, I'm going to do this. And if I don't, you know, save you money, I'm not going to get paid. And so he's like, let me run your ads, please. He's like, because I, you're going to get so many calls from people. Just everyone wants to, you know, uh, improve your conversion rate. Everyone wants to manage your paid ads, but nobody wants to like lower your cost of goods. Nobody wants to, you know, reduce your overhead or streamline your supply chain. He's like, it's an incredible offer. You, you need to run ads for this. Like you're going to get, you know, millions of, of calls. He's like, please let me do this for you. He's like, I'm not even going to charge you. He's like, but if you get a commission, if you make money, just give me a little commission. And, um, and people really appreciate that because when I talk to them, um, they're like, how do you get paid? Like, what, you know, where are you making money from this? It's like, well, if you work with my partner, I get paid. If you don't work with my partner, I don't get paid. And they're like, all right, cool. They appreciate that. Yeah. And they like that. I'm not charging them. Sure. Yeah. So I, I, I like that model. Yeah, it makes sense. You're you're providing value, even if it's not uh, directly related to something that's gonna that's gonna be your product or your immediate um, you know suite of services. And continuing to provide value is what makes you um, uh, increase your value in other areas and, and grow your reputation in your industry and others as a as a subject matter expert or a you know um, someone who really knows their industry. So yeah. So you're doing real estate lending. Do you have a regulated fund or an unregulated fund, or is it not a fund at all? Um, we are regulated. Um, we are able to accept different investor classes based on different um, net worth requirements. Um, and we are um, based in California, so we go off of the um, rules and regulations in the state of California. I'm looking at starting a fund to invest in e-commerce brands right now but probably based in in the UK or Spain, somewhere EU. Is it difficult to set up a regulated fund? I mean, there's financial audits and things like that that you have to go through. That's the biggest hurdle, really. Um, and, and there's a, a high upfront cost. I'm not sure about in, the, in Europe or in any other country outside of the United States, but um, it's really just um, track record, uh, legal costs for organization and then the ongoing financial audits and things like that, 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 um, that we have to maintain that are expensive, but it, you know, it opens up different types of investor classes that we can, that we can work with. Um, and it broadens, you know, the types of different loans that we can do because, you know, different types of investors have different, you know, capital thresholds and, um, economic splits and things like that. And so by, diversifying the different kinds of investors that we can take in. We can offer different product suites. Is there a difference between a real estate investment trust and what you're doing? And if so, what is the difference? So yes, um, we are not a, we're not a publicly traded company and we are not a re so we are a, a pooled fund of investors and we're managed by uh, a management company that has the authority to act on behalf of the fund investors. So each of the investors that come into the fund have different shares um, based on their percentage of investment. And then we manage the fund on their behalf. So we're set up more like a partnership structure um, and we are not um, a REIT. And we don't invest in okay. hard assets either. So um, we invest in loans. Okay. You, what do you mean by you invest in loans? Is so it, what will is we it make different from just lending specifically? So we so we make loans uh, and then and so on on that are secured by real estate in a first lien position, and then we can sell those loans to other investors. We can buy other loans um, that are also secured by real estate, um, but our our fund is exclusively um, the primary fund is exclusively a debt fund. We also have another fund that is for equity investment. So we would invest into an, um, into an other operator, another, um, multifamily investor or residential fix and flip operator. And then we would get a partnership and an, an investment, um, percentage and ownership percentage in their business, as opposed to just investing in the real estate itself. So we have both, um, avenues for investing depending upon the type of return that we want to yield for our respective investors um, and for our own capital that we've invested and um, but everything is focused on uh, real estate for the most part we do have some other ancillary things but what are, what are those oh we've invested in all kinds of different things we've invested in a mobile mobile vet business 
Um, we've invested in um, uh, an AI platform. We mostly mostly things that are ancillary to the real estate company, really creating that entire ecosystem. But there are other things that have presented to presented that have been presented to us that have either been something we believed in um, for an environmental aspect or for a social aspect or another woman owned business um, or minority owned business that we really wanted to help um, expand their reach. And, and then, um, so we've, we've done some small investments and in other things like that as well. Interesting. Yeah. I've invested in a few companies that have nothing to do with e-commerce. Well, one of them is uh, e-commerce liquidation, and then the other two, one's a headhunting firm for AI, ML, okay. and data science jobs, and the other is uh, like artificial intelligence, business intelligence, automations, and and integrations. So yeah, usually, usually what we focus on. Businesses. It's good to be diverse. I mean, it's obviously it's important to have you you know whether you're investing in in real estate related activities or funds or e-commerce or a mobile vet business or the stock market, it's, it's obviously always good to be um, diverse in your portfolio. And so we've, for the most part, we invest in like that ecosystem, anything that kind of supports valuation, underwriting, anything that kind of helps uh, expand and grow the capabilities of our platform. Um, but then there's always other things as well that we, that we have um, had a little diversion into. Is there anything we haven't mentioned that you want to bring up? No, I mean, I think that, I think we covered a lot. I think, I know that for me, looking at the shift in my mindset from when I first started our very first company, when we, the very first fund that we had um, to now the biggest change and the biggest thing that I would say is, is really just um, having ownership over who you are ownership over that authenticity. And, and it's hard in the beginning of your career to, to set those boundaries and to say, uh, and to not, not to say no, but to not say yes every time. And I think that's something that's really important, um, as a part of being really authentic in who you are. Um, so would you say that's the most important thing you've learned in life or is there something more important you've learned? Um, I think in business, not necessarily in life, but in, in business and maybe in life as well. Um, the most, the thing I've learned that has resonated the most with me is that no is the second best answer you can hear and you can give a quick. No is better than a long, slow. No. 